Hi, everyone. Welcome to our 27th meeting of this Rotary year. Before we start, let's hear the housekeeping rules. Over to you, Vinit. Thank you, Jessica. So the rules should be very uh, easy to remember for everyone by now. Please take a second and put yourself on mute if you are not already on mute, so you're not interrupting other speakers. Uh, try to keep your video on so that we can put a name to your face. And do make sure you're signed in with the correct name. Uh, if you're signed on as ABC's iPhone, it becomes very difficult to figure out who you are. So please do check the name you're signed in under and make sure it's something we recognize. Uh, we do have a chat function that allows us to engage with each other and also ask questions to our speaker. So do make use of that, or you could raise your hand at any time so that you get called on at the appropriate time. Uh, and you will be unmuting yourself for the toast. Do remember to mute yourself again after that. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and will be shared on social media. Uh, so I do request uh, by, by continuing to attend, you are confirming that you're okay with that. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to President Lewis. Thank you very much, Sajay and I'm Vinit. So now I would like to invite, before we go to the next segment, which is the toast to our Rotary International and for visiting clubs, uh, can I ask Director Subash to welcome our guests first? Subash. Thank you, President okay. Luis. Uh, I'm very honored to welcome record number of guests today. Uh, a lot of guests have been invited by our uh, Dr. Chan. Our, I, uh, the guests are Charlie Lim, Peng Bi Hin, Rinal Otsuka, Cedric Chu, John Chu, Kevin Pang, and Marcus Mu. We all seven guests have been invited by our Dr. Chan. Then we have guests invited by our PP Mark. Uh, GSU, uh, GSU and CC, and then uh, our some prospects members which have joined us today are Vimal, Taru, and Charles Hall. Uh, uh, I uh, this is a big list. If I have missed out or mispronounced some names, I apologize for that. And I welcome all our guests to this meeting. And you can participate with full capacity in the discussions tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Director Subash. Uh, perhaps I would like to ask if uh, our members who had invited guests and we missed it out, uh, would you like to address us on this and uh, let us uh, know who you had invited? Anyone? Okay. If there isn't, then we'll now go to some announcement. Uh, but before that, Toastmaster, can you please uh, do the toasting? I think that will be uh, Dipti. Yes, uh, President Bo, it's, uh, it's my pleasure today to raise a toast uh, to uh, Rotary Club of Singapore uh, along with uh, Rotary International. Cheers. Rotary, Rotary International. Rotary International. Rotary, International. Rotary, International. Yes. Rotary yes. Club of Singapore. Thank you, Rotary and Dipti. And now, okay, Elizabeth Chi, who is here with us this evening, happy birthday. Thank and thank you. you, thank you for joining us okay. on your birthday. And then we have for tomorrow, Vivek Chabra, and then Chipin, who is here, 15th January, uh, Zicheng, 17th of January. Happy and blessed birthday to all of you. And then we also have, yes, really, who is here this evening. Okay, tomorrow will be his and uh, his beloved wife, uh, wedding celebrations, and then P.P. Ko Chun Hui and Louisa Lee, 16th and 17th of January. So we wish them all the very best and may they have more good years ahead. Happy anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. Happy anniversary, everybody. Happy anniversary, yes. Thank you. And next slide. Okay, this is uh, something which we, we need to address and that's why we need to bring it up here. Outstanding deals for members. You know, <laughs> so we have 60% of members who have already um, settled their dues. There are still 72 members with outstanding dues and we are oh, now into January. So, okay, we appeal to all members, please you know, settle your dues with us uh, by end of this month. 
Okay. Thank you very much for your cooperation. The club needs, uh, you know, the uh, dues to be paid so that we can uh, continue to function. Next, okay, uh, some events that are coming up. District 3310 Community Service Projects Showcase, and that will be 14th of January at, at 7pm to 10pm. This is the Zoom link, which we will actually send to all. And at 9.15th, Okay, during this event, our Vice President Ronald Wong will be addressing the uh, project on this thing called Ascendo. Because the full name is Project Ascendo Illumin Illuminating Awareness on Mental Well-Being. An important topic which are, uh, you know, widely discussed and uh, there are many people around the world talking about mental wellness and this is critical, especially during this COVID and the pandemic and, you know, lockdown. Uh, there are a lot of people who need help with mental wellness. So do log in. Um, we will send the link again. For guests and friends who are not in the chat groups, okay, uh, reach out to your, you know, friend who invited you and then ask for the link and support this event. Okay, next one, 17th of January, which is next week, Monday, 4 p.m. Our Rotary Club will be signing the letter of collaboration with the National Center for Infectious Diseases. Now, as you all know, you know, in Singapore, we are doing very well with the, you know, how COVID is uh, being, you know, handled. And a lot of the information that comes out is actually from this organization called the National Center for infectious diseases. And so we are doing a collaboration with NCID and we are going to do our camps and uh, uh, training programs. So we are signing the collaboration letter next week, 17th of January at 4 p.m. Uh, we do have some space for physical, uh, not sure if it's filled up yet, but then there will be Zoom. So do, do support this event by you know, attending the Zoom sessions. We will post it again on the different chat groups. Next up, okay. 26th of January, 2022. For those who had attended the first, you know, uh, physical meeting for this Rotary year that was in December, you know, we thank you all for coming in a great force. It was a confidence and a motivational event where we see people really coming out and attending the physical meetings. And uh, as we move along, okay, we hope that we can do this regularly, meaning every week, okay? And through the help of uh, Director Song Zi Cheng and also President nominee, you know, uh, Dr. Chan, Chan Siu Lun, okay, uh, discussions have been, you know, made with Tangling Club. And the agreement is that we will use Tangling Club and the conditions that we have, uh, you know, uh, fulfilled will be that there will be parking again in the main club building, you know, the levels that are above. Uh, I believe that's level three and four and also the roof. So 30% of guaranteed attendance will be given. Okay, so 30% of uh, coupons to park there. Okay, and because we are doing evenings, okay, I think it is also a fixed rate per entry charge. So it is really not so bad. I believe it's like $5, okay, if you park there. So in the past, we had problems with parking because uh, during the end part before we moved to Hyatt, we had problems with getting parking facilities. And we just had to uh, deal with a few lots at the sports complex. But now we are back. We're going to Churchill Room and then we'll have the meeting there. So 26th of January is also important because we are going to have the four-way test debate. So all Rotarians, okay, whether, uh, whether you're members yet or members to be, okay, do join us, okay? We will have the dinner and the meeting, okay? The sequence will be made known, but it's likely to be meeting first. We must finish the food within an hour clear off the tables 
and then we start the meeting. This is uh, part of the, uh, you know, the COVID uh, safe measures that we have to follow. All right. So do join us next week, uh, or not next week, but 26th of January, 2022. Okay, next up. Okay, uh, membership director Subash has actually, you know, got a few Rotarians and they have come together to do this golf tournament for the N Polio program. As you all are aware, mm -hmm. N Polio is one of the signature program for Rotary International. So not just us, whatever we raise will be matched with by will be matched, I think, one to one by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And uh, this year's chairman for our club is Adnan Ansari. I'm not sure whether he's here or traveling, but uh, he has also uh, done a lot, you know, all the jolly walking and uh, uh, t-shirts, bomber jackets, watches. Okay, so yeah, so this is another program uh, which uh, Director Subash and some of the Rotarians have uh, come together to do this. So we're going to thank all of them for putting in this effort. And, you know, it is a wonderful project uh, to raise funds for Ed Polio. And now our next segment, okay, I would like to invite our birthday girl, okay, Elizabeth Chi, to give us the introduction to Mr. Hugh Lim. Elizabeth, please. Thank you, Louis. Uh, good evening, uh, President Louis. Um, past presidents and fellow Rotarians. So it gives us great pleasure to have Mr. Hugh Lim, the Executive Director for the Center of Livable Cities, to speak with us this evening on a very interesting and important topic, making Singapore livable in the era of climate change. Now, uh, you, sorry, I'm pronouncing it in the French way. <laughs> So used to French, sorry. So Hugh graduated from the University of Liverpool in 1987 with a Bachelor of Engineering first class de degree on, the, uh, on a Singapore Armed Forces Overseas Scholarship. He holds a Master of Science Management of Technology from the MIT United States of America in 1998. Hugh joined the Singapore Armed Forces in 1984 and attained the rank of Brigadier General on 1st July 2005. He has served in a variety of command and staff positions, including Chief Engineering, uh, Chief Engineer Officer, Commander 6th Division, Commander Training and Doctrine Command, and Chief of Staff General Staff. Prior to joining CLC, Hugh was the CEO of the Building and Construction Authority. Previously, he held the appointments of Deputy Secretary um, for the Community Youth and Sports at the Ministry of Culture and the Deputy Secretary Ministry of Law. Hugh is married with three children and has a keen interest in technology, sports and photography. So um, for tonight's topic, Hugh will give us a context setting and broad overview of Singapore's current status as a global city and enduring home. He will also highlight Singapore's city-state challenges. So without much, uh, without further ado, we shall let you enlighten us on this topic. So you, over to you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Good evening, Rotarians, and a very happy 2022 to all of you. I'm very honored to be invited to speak to you and I will begin with an overview of the Singapore Green Plan 2030, which is a whole of nation effort to achieve sustainable development and living in the face of climate change. This should provide a context for our discussion on making Singapore livable in this era of climate change. Now this era has also been referred to as the Anthropocene, when human impact on the Earth's climate and ecosystems has become significant. Unwinding the impact or lessening it will require changes in the way we live and consume. And these are captured in the Singapore Green Plan 2030. Now, Singapore today, as many of you are aware, is an economically vibrant city state with a beautiful and green environment to live in, with efficient infrastructure, 
and full access to clean water. Yet we are also one of the most densely populated cities in the world. So achieving this has been the result of decades of effort to provide good homes and a good living environment. When Singapore became independent in 1965, we were neither livable nor sustainable. In fact, Singapore struggled with overcrowded slums, poor sanitation, pollution, disease, flooding, and many other challenges. Since then, Singapore has transformed itself into one of the world's most livable cities, even as the population here has tripled. However, this has always been against the backdrop of the need for our growth and development to be sustainable, including ensuring access to our supply of water, energy, food, other resources, and making sure that we manage our pollution and our environment. Now, every city has its unique challenges. And as a small island city-state, Singapore faces the challenge of limited land and natural resources. Yet, we have to accommodate not just the needs of a typical city, housing, healthcare, recreation, and employment, but also those for an independent nation. And these include airports, seaports, military facilities, and reservoirs. So as our city matures, Singapore must continue to address the needs of an aging population and explore new ways to improve livability. To overcome these and sustain growth in an era of climate change, Singapore has adopted an integrated and long-term planning approach to optimize our resources in order to ensure a clean and green environment, provide adequate quality housing, and cater to the needs of our economy. The Singapore Green Plan 2030. Under this plan, Singapore has committed to capping our CO2 equivalent emissions at 65 million tonnes by 2030 and to halve this by 2050. Our stated goal is to achieve net zero emissions as soon as possible by the second half of this century. But as Minister Grace Fu mentioned at the end of COP26, just a couple of months ago, we are starting to review these targets. The Singapore Green Plan 2030 sets out the key goals and strategies for collective action by all stakeholders, including the private sector and the community. It covers five key pillars, namely city in nature, energy reset, sustainable living, green economy, and resilient future. So over the next few slides, I will provide an overview of these five pillars and how they contribute toward a future Singapore that is livable and sustainable. Pillar one is city in nature. By 2030, the goal is to have, is for Singapore to be a green and beautiful city in nature, not just a garden city or city in a garden. And every household will live within a 10 minute walk of a park. Under this pillar, we will plant 1 million more trees across our island, which will improve livability here. We will add over 130 hectares of new nature parks with 170 hectares of existing parks enhanced with more lush vegetation and natural landscapes. Furthermore, Singapore will increase the total area of sky rise greenery from around 130 hectares to 200 hectares by 2030. Pillar two is energy reset which is about using cleaner energy and increasing energy efficiency to lower our carbon footprint. Singapore will transition our energy supply to low carbon alternatives in the next few decades. This is not an easy transition because almost all our energy is imported and we lack space to efficiently tap on renewable energy sources. For now, solar energy is very space inefficient whilst we lack sufficient wind or rivers for other forms of renewable energy. Nonetheless, the aim is to maximize the generation of solar energy within our borders as much as space allows. So our solar energy deployment will increase to at least two gigawatt peak by 2030. That's about five times up from 2020 levels. One of the more novel projects is the floating solar photovoltaic farm in Tengah Reservoir. 
This 60 megawatt peak solar PV farm is a partnership between National Water Agency, PUB, and the SEMCOP Floating Solar Singapore. And it was officially opened in July, 2021. It comprises 122,000 floating solar panels, occupying a total area of 45 hectares and will power PUB's water treatment plants. The expected carbon savings will be equivalent to removing 7,000 cars from our roads. Concurrently, through the use of good design, coupled with smart technology, we will increase the energy efficiency of our buildings, and this will help reduce our overall energy consumption. Our Singapore Green Building Master Plan targets are summarized as 80, 80, 80. This refers to 80% of Singapore's buildings being green by 2030, 80% of new developments to be super low energy buildings by 2030. These are buildings which are 60% more energy efficient than the 2005 baseline. And thirdly, an 80% improvement in energy for the best in class green buildings by 2030. In the area of transportation, all new vehicles are to be cleaner energy models from 2030 with ICE or internal combustion engine vehicles being phased out completely by 2040. So to support the growth of EVs, we will need to have about 60,000 charging points nationally by 2030 from around 2000 currently. Under pillar three, which is about sustainable living, we will reduce reliance on private vehicles with public transport ride share increasing from 64% today to 75% by 2030. And this will be comparable to major cities like London and New York City. To support this, the rail network will need to expand from 230 kilometers today to 360 kilometers, whilst the cycling network will be expanded from 460 kilometers to 1,320 kilometers. Pillatory also aims to instill the principles of a circular economy where resources are efficiently used reuse, recycle, and upcycle, thereby minimizing waste. We've already closed our water loop by recycling our used water to become new water. And we will make a similar strong push towards circularity in waste materials. The Tuas Nexus plan is an example of how we can improve circularity. The world's first integrated waste and water treatment facility it is expected to result in carbon savings of more than 200,000 tons of CO2 annually and is scheduled for completion in 2025. It is actually the fifth of six planned waste to energy plants that reduce waste to ash through incineration, which helps to save space at Singapore's only landfill. Circularity can be increased further by recovering the incineration bottom ash to be used as a new construction material called new sand. So we envisage that new sand will be used as a sand replacement in construction. And this is in line with other efforts in the built environment sector to reduce waste and to improve efficiency through prefabrication. We also maximize resource recovery of demolition materials or reuse and recycling at the end of a building's life cycle. For example, recycled concrete aggregates made from demolition materials are reclaimed and it can be used in cement for non-structural applications or in the sub-base layer in roads. In 2019, 99% of the 1.4 million tons of demolition waste was successfully recycled in this manner. Measures to reduce food waste are also being considered by the National Environment Agency. So closing the food resource loop through food resource valorization measures that convert food waste into other valuable products can help to bring our city closer to circularity. This is projected to help increase Singapore's food waste recycling rate up from its current level of 19%. Pillar four is the green economy, and it explores how our efforts to deal with climate change can present new opportunities for growth, job creation, and to harness sustainability as a competitive advantage for Singapore. We aim to establish Singapore as a carbon services hub for the region to support green growth in Asia and Southeast Asia. Green finance is a key enabler of this since it supports investments 
into green technologies, products, and services. The Monetary Authority of Singapore, or MES, has launched a Green Finance Action Plan, which outlines key strategies to grow Singapore into the green financing hub of region. The Economic Development Board, EDB, and Enterprise Singapore have engaged companies with the relevant expertise to establish a presence here. These companies can offer services such as low carbon project development, consulting and verification services for the clean development mechanism, which is a UN run carbon offset scheme and in carbon footprinting. The enterprise sustainability program can also help companies, particularly small and medium enterprises embrace sustainability and develop strengths in this area. Enterprise Singapore will set aside up to $180 million for the program and is expected to benefit at least 6,000 enterprises over the next four years. The program will support training workshops, capability and product development projects, and key enablers such as certification and financing. We are also promoting homegrown innovation under the Research Innovation and Enterprise 2025 plan and attracting relevant companies to anchor the R&D activities in Singapore, so as to develop new solutions in areas such as carbon capture, utilization and storage, low carbon hydrogen, energy efficient materials, and solutions for the circular economy, amongst others. The last pillar is resilient future, and it looks into taking steps to adapt to climate change. So against the threat of sea level rise, Singapore will need to put in place physical defenses to protect our coastlines, beginning with the most vulnerable parts of our island. Singapore will always be hot and humid since we're near the equator, but we don't want temperatures to become uncomfortably high. So we're moderating the urban heat island effect by increasing greenery and piloting the use of cool paint on building facades. Singapore is also increasing food production to make our food supply more resilient. In partnership with the agri-food industry, we aim to produce at least 30% of our nutritional needs within our borders by 2030. And this is up from less than 10% currently. The 30 by 30 effort will also look into encouraging citizens to support local produce and to train a new generation of local agri-specialists. The Singapore Green Plan charts ambitious but concrete targets over the next 10 years. The Green Plan is a living plan, which we will continue to evolve as we engage Singaporeans to harness more ideas and to put them into action. Depending on the progress of our collective actions, as well as the future development of carbon capture and sequestration technology and carbon markets, you can expect that our carbon emission commitments will be reviewed and we may well seek to achieve our net zero emissions even sooner. Finally, uh, say tackling climate change is a global challenge and how cities around the globe adapt to and mitigate climate change will be a critical enabler for their livability and sustainability. So before I end, I, I would like to invite all of you to consider joining us at this year's World City Summit, where the Center for Livable Cities will convene city leaders, industry experts, NGOs and academia at the forefront of these issues to explore how cities can promote livability, sustainability, and resilience while navigating this era of climate change. And your participation will certainly help us shape the global discourse on this important topic. So as you can see, this is a very wide ranging subject and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, you for this very interesting and informative presentation. Uh, we definitely have a lot of burning questions to ask you. So, um, uh, fellow Rotarians, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, put them on the group chat. Um, I think I'll be the first to start. Okay. Um, a question for you, you on the energy reset. Now, our solar panels and electric vehicles helps move Singapore, help Singapore move towards cleaner energy usage and increases our energy efficiency. However, these materials would ultimately need to be scrapped when their useful lives are depleted, which would then result in new waste. So my question is, are there existing measures to ensure a holistic management 
of new energy sources and their waste as per the circular system of reuse and recycle. Thank you, Elizabeth. I, I would share firstly that uh, there was a zero waste master plan, which was introduced in 2019. That's just about three years ago. And it charts out how Singapore can adopt a circular economy approach to sustainable waste and resource management. So under this plan, uh, there are waste streams, especially construction, food, packaging, and electronic e-waste, which would include solar panels uh, being targeted. And part of this uh, holistic management involves, of course, firstly, avoiding waste in the first place, but also to increase the overall recycling rate. And um, this will go up to 70% uh, by 2030. Now, specifically, of course, to solar panels, you know, it's um, you know, still an emerging uh, set of technologies uh, because the deployment in Singapore is really, uh, as I mentioned, it, it will need to go up five times uh, by 2030. So I would say we, we, are, we are still very much in the phase of deploying it, uh, not so much yet in that phase of uh, trying to recover uh, the, the waste from solar panels. Uh, the other thing I think that we may well see is that as solar panels become more and more efficient, uh, we may replace uh, some of the older panels, but redeploy them to other places where space is perhaps not as tight uh, as we experience in Singapore. Now in January 2019, um, I understand SAMCOP and Singpoly uh, actually signed a collaboration to commercialize uh, the Singapore's first solar panel recycling process. So this process, which is uh, being developed locally by researchers, will involve extracting the recyclable materials from parts of used solar panels. And these include glass, silicon, and the metals, which include silver and aluminum. Uh, there's also currently a joint venture company, Metavolt, that engages in industrial solar panel recycling. And it's uh, now based in Cleantech Park uh, in Jurong. So it was uh, evolved from a technology spin-off from NTU. And um, we do look forward to it uh, actually scaling up, uh, even as we prepare to deal with the waste stream uh, from something like uh, solar panels in future. Thank you, Yu. Uh, I see uh, a number of hands uh, raised up to ask um, questions. So um, perhaps Subesh, you'd like to start? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lem. It's an excellent presentation, you know, and very, uh, very interesting one. Now, I have a very simple question. All these things, targets which we are putting, <clears throat> the various, very challenging targets, you know, the considering now the kind of manpower we have, the kind of we are struggling. It is for how many people? It is 10 million city or 5.5 million city? You need not to answer this question if it is uh, uh, too direct, you know, the because this is very important. Entire development is linked with this. Is it livable for 10 million people or livable for 5.5 million people? Thank you. And thank you for the question. You know, I think the, this, this whole uh, topic on uh, livability and population, you know, obviously it has, uh, has many rounds uh, uh, going back uh, quite a number of years. You know, but I would say the approach that, um, you know, Singapore takes uh, is really to prepare ahead. You know, um, even before we reach the level where you know, the population is higher, I think the whole intention is to make sure that we put in place the capacity uh, to keep pace with our growth, uh, very much the same way that has happened you know, since the founding of Singapore. And as I mentioned at the start, you know, our population actually has increased three times uh, since our independence. Um, so I think part of the challenge for us is to make sure that we provide for housing, transport, and economy for the population, uh, no matter how it grows. And I think the issue is then, how do we make sure that things like recreational facilities uh, also keep pace? So this is something that I think will continue to evolve. But I think the important point is that um, for Singapore, uh, we need to plan ahead and to provide uh, for the space uh, that caters to the population as it grows. Now, one of the things that I, I observe is that um, like actually population growth is not it's not accelerating. If anything, for Singapore, uh, it's probably slowed down. And part of this, yeah, and I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, has to do uh, with lower birth rates. 
So that's something that's um, certainly a, a reality uh, for us to, to contend with going forward. In fact, I think our challenge moving forward is you know, how to make sure that the services that we need uh, in Singapore uh, can continue to be provided. And you know, during this time of uh, the pandemic, you know, certain industries uh, slowed down, but actually the demand for manpower actually increased in many other, in many other sectors. So the question is when the pandemic is over and uh, a lot of the manpower returns to what it was doing, you know, how do we continue to find the manpower to do a lot of other things? So in the construction sector where I was working uh, previously in my previous uh, um, appointment, uh, there's a lot of effort to see how do we continue to be able to uh, provide for the kind of housing and development needs without increasing you know, the stock of uh, workers that need to come in. So a big push on construction productivity, uh, which really refers to you know, how, how we can continue to produce without just adding more and more hit count uh, to, to generate the same output. Okay, thank you, Hugh. Next question we have from uh, Vinny. Um, Vinny, do you want to read the um, ask the question yourself or shall I read it out for you? Ah, I can ask that. Yeah. So I was just, uh, I, I recall one of the first things I saw when I moved to Singapore was this $100 billion plan. And one of the key things was raise the level by about 10 meters, right? Because the worst case scenario was about four or five meters increase in sea level. Uh, and I, I was just curious about how would that whole plan be executed? How does one go about raising the sea level, uh, uh, raising the height from the sea of a whole country? So just curious to understand how that would work. Sure. Um, well, I mean, it was a, it, there was a study that was, I, I was actually quite closely involved in. And um, um, actually not all of Singapore is low lying. So part of that study also was identifying that, you know, if sea level rose, um, not by 10 meters, but, you know, basically by another meter or so, uh, which parts of Singapore would be impacted. So, you know, we, we, we did identify a number of areas that are more vulnerable. And um, I think Prime Minister shared in um, if I'm not wrong, 20, 2019, um, you know, this intention, I think that's where that number came from. Um, but he did share, for example, our East Coast, uh, which was reclaimed quite a number of years ago, is, is actually lower uh, than what would be considered uh, safe uh, if sea level rose. So there is an effort underway to look at what are the different solutions that could be adopted. You know, of course, the, the simplest solution is to build a higher wall, right? But um, if we wanted to balance, uh, you know, both uh, livability and space requirements, uh, then it calls on us to be more creative and more innovative in how we go about doing it. So, you know, at this stage, I think the actual solutioning has not been decided as yet, uh, but there would be a need to raise uh, uh, the level of the land uh, in the coastal area, uh, impacting the East Coast. That, that's, that's, that's something for sure. Um, the pace at which we have to do it, um, you know, the climate, climate science, I think, is still evolving as to, you know, how quickly and to what extent um, sea level rise uh, would affect us. And that, I think, will shape how quickly we have to move uh, on this particular effort. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Next question we have from uh, IPP, Mark. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I, th I think Singapore uh, is in safe hands with your participation. So I'm not worried about Singapore. But Singapore, after all, is a little red dot on the map. So uh, if, if the rest of the world is not sustainable or, and so on, so wouldn't that affect us? Uh, how can we, it's, it's more of a global problem. How can we uh, help with that? Thank you. It's a, it's a very, very important question. And uh, you're right, Singapore is, is a little red dot. Um, but you know, I think what Singapore can do uh, is of, of course to share some of the efforts that we do that's also part of the mandate uh, for my centre, uh, not just um, uh, capturing Singapore's experience but sharing it with partners uh, around the region and around the world. Uh, and one example of um, what we have done is in the, the green building effort uh, is to quite openly share what our standards are, 
Now, Singapore's um, uh, green building standards are very much optimized for the tropics. So the standards that we adopt here uh, can be quite directly applied in many other tropical cities. And that will help other cities uh, similarly address this whole issue of uh, uh, climate change within, uh, within their own development. Uh, at the same time, of course, you know, other things that we, that we do here, uh, we do share them with our partners. And I mentioned the World City Summit. Uh, that is one of the platforms that we adopt uh, to be able to um, share out uh, some of our experiences, but also to take on board lessons that other cities have, uh, have uh, uh, adopted. Um, so I would say, you know, at this stage, you know, one of the most important efforts is uh, sharing of knowledge and leveling up uh, the understanding of leaders in all cities, as well as other professionals, you know, how to tackle this issue of climate change. And, you know, from my own observation, um, you know, many countries have um, made commitments to address climate change. But, you know, from my conversations with uh, leaders from other cities, um, realize many of them are still grappling with how to go about doing this. So it's not necessarily you know, just a question of will, uh, but it is a question also of knowledge. And Singapore can certainly play a part in enabling you know, other cities to work out a way forward. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Brilliant. All is brilliant. All right. Can so, I go? Uh, Sorry, um, perhaps now we have um, Rotarian Hula who, who has put up her hand for a long time. <laughs> Hi, yes, I'm, um, I was wondering how the plans will affect um, uh, with the new developments. I mean, now the distance working becoming more uh, norm, normal and uh, Singapore has a problem with uh, population. So how do you think it, this, will, uh, this development will affect the city planning? Like, do we need a lot of offices or do you think like, do you think a scenario that like Singapore will be the headquarters and maybe the, 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 the uh, other places will be like production centers, like will it help at the productivity with the less, less human, um, less people uh, in, 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 in here? or like same amount of people. So I feel like it can be like helpful because of the uh, space problem in Singapore. Distance working might have been uh, helping, in the, uh, helping in increasing the production with, with uh, less migration to here. Or you don't need the accommodation. Everybody, everybody doesn't have to be here. How do you, how do you see these developments? Oh, thank you very much for your questions. It's a very pertinent question particularly after the pandemic, I think has shown many yes. employers that uh, maybe there's a different way of working. We don't all need to rush into the office you know, every morning and all rush yes. back at the same time in the, in the evening. Yes. So in many cities, you know, we, we cater transport networks for peak, peak loads. But yes. if the load can be spread out, you know, suddenly perhaps uh, you, know, you don't need to cater quite as much. I think many companies and employers are also considering, do they need as much office space if uh, people are actually able to work productively from home? So I'm quite sure that uh, post-COVID, uh, there will be changes in the use of space. Um, it's not necessarily you know, a, a zero sum because our homes, we, we do have them. But certainly if we had to work from home, you know, some people realize perhaps um, they do need a bit more space uh, down there. So um, I'm quite sure in the office space that there will be a re-evaluation of what is needed. Um, but for Singapore, of course, you know, some, one of the broader questions that's asked uh, is whether you know, all the services that we need, uh, do they all need to be no, here in Singapore? And yeah. actually I've observed for quite a number of years you know, companies, you know, have relocated some of their activities uh, out of Singapore uh, into the region, you know, whether it's to, to Philippines, Vietnam, uh, uh, India, uh, there are actually quite a number of services that have moved out. So they're being actually provided from, from offshore already. And that itself, I think, will, will reduce, 
you know, the number of people that you need to, to come in uh, to, to physically uh, live here. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I think we, we recognize that, um, you know, in, um, in the pandemic, um, for example, there are uh, workers who commute daily uh, from Johor to come in to provide services here. And when the borders were closed, uh, there was an immediate impact uh, on their ability to do that. So that, that will also, I think, force us to reconsider you know, how such services are manned. Uh, do you, uh, if they are essential services, you know, do the people who provide them uh, need to be here and need to be accommodated here? So these are, I think, not the, the, the jury is probably still out as to the actual landing. Um, but I think what is uh, quite clear to us is that uh, the extended period of work from home uh, actually demonstrate it is quite doable, certainly quite, quite possible to do. Um, in November, uh, when I participated in the Bloomberg New Economy Forum, uh, one of the conversations that we, that we had with a, a tech company based in Silicon Valley you know, was that actually half their workforce uh, was not even based in America. They were connecting in from other parts of the world, even before the pandemic. So they had already configured to operate uh, as a tech company uh, without having the full workforce uh, in one location. Uh, so I think this is probably the start of um, many more possibilities uh, for how work can be organized and where the workforce actually needs to be uh, to be able to deliver its services. Thank you very much. Thank you, you. Um, next, we have um, Dublina. Dublina, your question, please. Hey, thank you. I'll ask a quick question because we have been, we are taking up quite a bit of time. Thank you, you, for the fantastic talk. I just, uh, I think you know already. Thank you, Elizabeth, for bringing him on. That we do projects in uh, Singapore Rotary Club and all the worldwide Rotary Clubs. So, if you could touch base on if we do supposedly an international project and we want livable cities and your program to be a part of it, how do we go about that and doing that? Is it as simple as calling you and saying that this is the project you're thinking and how to go from there or are there like other, other things we need to keep at the back of my, our mind if you're thinking something on uh, that end? Well, I, I think a, a good starting point, as I said, is, uh, you know, the, the, the World City Summit. You know, this is where, you know, we actually convene city leaders uh, from around the world to, to come here actually to, to talk about, you know, how do you address livability and sustainability issues? Uh, so that's probably a, a good starting point. Um, you know, my center runs a number of programs, uh, capacity building programs uh, for uh, city leaders and officials from uh, around the world as well. Um, I, I would say there's probably, you know, no uh, sim single starting point uh, for doing this. Um, if I were to reflect, uh, for example, on um, some of our own efforts with um, uh, building energy efficiency, um, with a number of schools, for example, we, we actually trained um, alumni from the schools uh, to return to conduct um, energy audits. And those students uh, being uh, trained as energy audits were then able to provide you know, recommendations uh, for the principals, how they could actually reduce the energy footprint uh, of their respective schools. Uh, so we found that that was, you know, quite an effective way uh, to be able to reach out and, you know, almost adopt a you know, more ground up approach to tackling the issue of uh, energy efficiency and, and ultimately uh, the carbon footprint uh, of a building. Um, so, you know, there, there are, I think, top down uh, type measures uh, that can be taken, uh, for example, um, leveling up the knowledge of city officials and leaders, you know, how to put in place policies and uh, programs to address livability and sustainability, and there are also ground up uh, efforts that can also uh, be initiated. You are on mute, Elizabeth. Sorry. So I was saying that we have a burning question by Kirti. 
on the topic of uh, electric vehicle and hydrogen energy. Kirti, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Yu, Mr. Yu, thank you for enlightening us on what uh, Singapore's plans for climate change and carbon emission reduction. Uh, I want to understand by 2030, you had planned that what percentage of the EV vehicles would be on the automotive sales in Singapore? And how fast will the EV charging infrastructure be created? Because worldwide, they have the problem on the depression of sales because of lack of infrastructure for EV charging. And the second question is, what are the plans for green hydrogen energy generation and green hydrogen fuel for shipping and transportation and carbon capture? Thank you. Um, for, I think for EVs, the, the current schedule is that by 2030, um, you will only be able to put a, a clean energy vehicle on the road. You, you won't be able to register a new um, ICE uh, vehicle. So that's from 2030 onwards. Of course, how quickly it ramps up you know, towards then, I, I think will depend very much on the take up of the market. Um, you know, it wasn't too long ago that we, we didn't see many EV models on the road, but uh, those, those have increased significantly uh, in the last year. So, you know, for, for the take up, I think you, you will see that uh, it's, a, it's actually a 20 year transition, you know. So from 2030, you only get EVs uh, or clean energy versions on the road. From 2040, you know, the, the last internal combustion engine we phase out uh, from Singapore. Uh, so that, that's for EVs. So on the charging infrastructure, um, I understand we have about 2,000 charging points island-wide uh, that services about 6,000 EVs uh, currently. Um, we need to increase it. And the goal is to get about 60,000 charging points in place uh, by 2030. Uh, again, not a, not a straightforward exercise because it requires you know, rewiring space uh, and you know, property owners have to be able to accommodate uh, putting such infrastructure uh, in place. For um, hydrogen, I would say it's, um, it's still early days yet. I don't think there is a, you know, a, a very clear cut uh, way to achieve it. I think we know what needs to be done, uh, but it's not necessarily something that could be done uh, here in Singapore uh, to generate green hydrogen. Uh, because you know, at the back of it, um, the, the energy you need uh, to generate the green hydrogen itself needs to be renewable. I mentioned in my presentation earlier that one of Singapore's great challenge is that we don't have renewable energy options other than solar at the moment. And solar is um, it's, it's space inefficient. Uh, we don't think it will make up more than about 10% of our energy supply in the, in the steady state. Uh, and that's already maximizing you know, all available spaces uh, to place uh, solar panels, including um, on, our, on our waters. So that's, uh, that's going to be a challenge for us. And that's why I think for Singapore, uh, the road to net zero uh, will have to include uh, a certain degree of import uh, from elsewhere. And that could include uh, green, energy, uh, green hydrogen from elsewhere. Thank you. You're again on mute. <laughs> Elizabeth, you're on mute. So sorry. <laughs> I'm saying that you, there are so many questions, um, so many people waiting to ask you questions on this very interesting topic. We have uh, next Anita to ask her question. Yes. Uh, Thank you, you for this uh, wonderful presentation. I have a question around, uh, you said that 30% uh, uh, Singapore is going to make the in-house production for food, right? Like, uh, so I want to just know which are the category of foods which they are focusing and uh, what are the initiatives they are taking to do that? Thank you. Um, to, to my knowledge, we've not specifically you know, uh, fixed the categories of food and um, you know what what I think we will be looking at is you know how how you can do it um, in a space efficient way I, I think that's the, the real challenge for us so if we include vegetables um, grown multi-story indoors on rooftops uh, we include fish and there's a quite a, 
quite a steady uh, aquaculture industry that's being uh, built up, uh, but perhaps not you know, merely uh, in the coastal areas around us, uh, but perhaps also in, in tanks and, and built up as well. Uh, so those, and of course, right now, you know, there is also uh, a move into looking at, you know, alternative uh, proteins uh, as well, uh, which could almost be, uh, you know, uh, manufactured uh, from labs rather than uh, grown in a, a traditional way. So, you know, uh, right now, I think that um, the idea is to look at, you know, all possibilities uh, really to maximize it. And 30 by 30, you know, is, is quite a stretch uh, for us. Okay, got that. And that that is that means the plant base, uh, uh, the meat which is like homegrown from the labs, right? Yeah, That's got right. that. Thank you. Thank you. And um, just now, Hugh, uh, you, uh, Hugh, sorry, you mentioned about the electricity, um, solar panel uh, electricity. We have a question from Taru. Um, yes, Taru. Yeah. Hi, uh, Mister Hugh. Uh, thank you for your presentation. So basically, my question is, let's say, uh, I think I recently read that uh, Singapore is going to receive about 15% electricity from Northern Australia by 2027, if I'm not wrong. And uh, is that part of this plan? And I think like, uh, when, we talk, when we talk about uh, electric cars, I think Stride have, has already like, I think about 300, about 300 taxis. Uh, we have already have uh, Stride's EV taxis. And uh, in terms of uh, safety, because I think uh, we do have like, Singapore at times are, you know, it's a very hot country. So we do have some explode cases and all that. So uh, how do you look at it, all this in terms of security? And also uh, if you're receiving electricity from Northern Australia, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be very costly. So uh, in terms of government agencies involvement and private companies involvement, uh, how do we look at it? Thank you. Um, to, to my knowledge, the, the proposal to develop uh, electricity from, from, uh, Australia, it's still, it's still being looked at. I, I don't think it's a, a firm proposal as yet. And um, of course, one of the ideas is whether you can generate it, uh, let's say through solar there and, and then cable it, you know, all the way here. Yes. Um, you know, but, you know, obviously if you cable something that far, there, there are also transmission losses uh, yes. along the way. So I, I'm not sure that that quite has been finalized yet. I think there's an intention to, to explore the possibility, including the, uh, the business case for doing it. Um, but I think what is quite clear is that in order for us to reduce the carbon footprint in Singapore, we do have to um, look at importing uh, energy. Now, whether the energy is you know, electric, uh, electricity uh, brought in through the grid, and there is a, an effort underway to connect uh, regionally, so that is a possibility, for example, from other uh, countries uh, around us that do have um, uh, renewable energy sources to spare. Um, or it could be in the longer term when the hydrogen economy is better established uh, to bring in um, uh, green hydrogen uh, that is you know, similar to the way today we bring in uh, liquefied natural gas. So those are all things that we have to look at. But I think underlying it is that we will need to import. Um, it's just that the, you know what you import may be maybe electrons, you know, rather than um, importing uh, gas uh, right. fuels. All right, thank you. I, I think you had a question on safety of EVs. I mean, yeah, and safety of EVs and also yeah. involvement of uh, government agencies and private uh, mm -hmm. companies in India. Yeah. yeah. I mean, every every car that comes in here, you know, goes through quite quite stringent uh, safety checks. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the vehicles that come in, I, I think will be no different from uh, you know petrol vehicle that comes in uh, and has to be certified before uh, it's brought onto the roads. Um, so I, I I don't think that will be any different from today how how you would see a, a petrol vehicle uh, being allowed to be uh, imported. Um, as far as you know, government or private companies, um, again, they are all hands on deck. Okay. The the um, the, the, the government agencies um, responsible, you know, obviously are very much involved in looking at, uh, for example, for the energy reset. You know, EMA is very much at the forefront of um, uh, examining how to make that transition from a carbon based uh, uh, power generation system. Uh, towards a renewable uh, 
energy system. And for the companies, you know, there, there are actually several uh, companies here that are already very much involved in that effort. Um, so one example that I would share, uh, you, I'm sure some of you have heard of this company, Sunseed. You know, Sunseed uh, is, is very much involved um, in the, uh, the whole solarization effort. So what happens um, is that um, uh, government agencies, like for example, HDB, uh, they actually take a you know, bulk purchase approach to um, uh, deploying solar panels. And you know, many of our housing board flats, you know, the rooftops are already made available to, to put uh, a solar PV, as well as public uh, sector buildings and schools. Now, if every building were to source uh, individually, you know, firstly, they may not have the expertise to set up their own uh, solar system. Uh, and they don't enjoy economy of scale. But by aggregating the purchase, um, the, uh, the government actually uh, enables uh, best-in-class panels to be sourced. And at the same time, uh, we get a competitive price to, to, bring it, uh, to bring them in. So that's something that uh, you know, government helps to create the, uh, the critical mass of demand, uh, as well as provide the expertise uh, to deploy solar in the best way possible. Uh, then, you know, private companies, of course, would then uh, provide and supply uh, these solutions as they come along. And by creating the scale, I think we, we can actually get uh, moving a, a lot quicker uh, than if we were to leave it to, you know, individual building owners uh, to find their own way forward. So it's, I think, very much a, a collaboration uh, between public and private in this case. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yu. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have Tom, who is also waiting to ask his uh, burning question. <laughs> yeah, thanks, um, Elizabeth. Um, my question comes from a different angle. Um, when I compare Singapore with, for example, Switzerland, there are some parts which are similar, but in Switzerland, you have a lot of association, you have a lot of big organizations. I believe the net zero target, it's not a target from one country, it's a target from one region, let's say Asia. Uh, would it be not a, 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 an opportunity for Singapore to set up organizations, agencies uh, to coordinate the work between the different countries within the net zero uh, target and become a more neutral place where mm. such a, a, a task can be organized and the center of living cities could be a kind of starting point um, uh, to bring people together because without organizations, without a coordinated process, it will not work. And isn't Singapore a perfect location and neutral place which can help to bring now these Asian countries together uh, mm -hmm. and discuss this based on the uh, in, on, on your on, on our um, uh, uh, population, which uh, already integrates a lot of cultures and and people. So uh, would this be not a nice challenge for Singapore? Tom, thank you very much for your question. Uh, I'm, I'm inclined to agree, and I think you know the. The room for collaboration across uh, countries and cities um, is uh, more urgent than ever. Um, for CLC, we work actually with quite a number of uh, city-level governments, and in fact, that's not a bad place to start because um, you know actually cities are, are, are actually largely responsible for the majority of carbon emissions. So we work uh, across with city governments uh, to deliver you know solutions. Uh, that different cities can adopt. Now, whether or not cities are able to adopt them in quite the same way, you know, is something that um, you know, each city leadership has, has to work out. It's not something I, I feel that we can compel uh, across the board. But I think by sharing uh, some of these ways forward, uh, we do see that there is um, uh, a greater urgency and interest in adopting solutions that will allow, as you, as you mentioned, really a, a net zero outcome for the region as a whole. Um, it's challenged in, in some sense by, you know, some countries are actually very much larger. Um, so it includes, you know, um, the need to 
safeguard you know, what is uh, already um, natural capital out there, the forests in the region, for example. Um, but you know, I think different governments do have to decide you know, how best they will balance uh, their own uh, development needs uh, versus the need to safeguard uh, what is the natural capital of the region. Okay, thank you, you. And uh, we have one question from Jacqueline on the uh, optimum population for Singapore uh, in the context of um, a livable city. So I'll let Jacqueline ask a question. Okay, hi, thanks uh, Elizabeth and Hugh. So I just want to find out about the, what your view on towards this 10 million population that uh, we're talking about in Singapore and what is that an optimum number that uh, we are looking at for a livable city? Oh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I must say, I think the, the number that things we put out there um, was really a capacity number. And, you know, for Singapore, um, we always try and plan ahead to ask ourselves, you know, if, if, if we had to accommodate X number of persons, um, what would it take? Uh, I would say, you know, straight off that there isn't a 10 million planning number uh, at the moment, right? And um, when I was growing up, you know, the population was uh, two plus million. We are, I think based on last year, we are 5.4 million. And that came down uh, a few hundred thousand from where we were uh, before the pandemic started. So at the same time, I think we, we, are, we are all quite aware that uh, birth rates are down, not just in Singapore, many other uh, cities, including in Asia, uh, birth rates are low. Um, so, you know, will it shoot up? And uh, earlier on, we discussed that uh, you know, there perhaps are different ways of uh, delivering services uh, in Singapore. Uh, so you might not need uh, to import labor to address some of those uh, uh, traditional tasks out there. So I would say that, you know, based on some of the lessons that we observed uh, during the pandemic, um, there are actually other ways of working. And those can alleviate some of the pressures that businesses and employers uh, may face. Uh, if they don't have you know, physically the manpower here to do the job. But for the, you know, the planners um, uh, that are looking at land and space, you know, I think what they're looking at is you know, what you need to do to support um, the population of the future. So if we okay. needed to set aside space and, and land to do it, then you know, how, do we, how do we achieve that? And you've also heard that um, we're also committed to preserving our natural spaces, which include um, the parks that are out there, uh, but also the nature reserves. And those, I must say, during uh, the pandemic, uh, I think really were lifesavers for Singapore and for Singaporeans. So we're not able to get out of the country. Um, having those green spaces there, I think is absolutely essential. Uh, so those are some things I think we will continue to make available down there. Uh, but it's also, I think, about making sure that the land and the space that we have, you know, is fully optimized. And, um, you know, we allow for um, the buffers that may be needed for crisis like COVID, but at the same time, provide the uh, space for Singaporeans. So is there an optimum number now based on the current space? No, I would say there's no optimum because it depends, you know, very much on uh, you know, what you set aside space for and what you create um, in terms of capacity to accommodate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you for so patiently answering so many questions from our members. It's such an interesting topic. Um, and if you could allow me to um, ask just one last question for tonight. Sure. Okay. Um, just now on the pillar of green economy, and you mentioned about uh, you know uh, making Singapore or rather Singapore to um, become a a hub for uh, providing uh, green services, uh, carbon services. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how much do we expect these uh, green growth opportunities to contribute to Singapore's economy? 
and uh, are we on track to developing new talents for the green industry to meet our own sustainability needs, as well as to become a carbon services hub? Thank you. I mean, it's a it's a it's a very interesting question um, because I think what what is considered the green economy itself is is still is still evolving. You know, many companies themselves have declared that they will become net zero by such and such a date. Um, how will they get there? So you know, if a if a company um, targets to be net zero, it, does it? Does it become a green company by itself? You know, so I would say for, for many for many companies, uh, that potential is, is already there. And in order to achieve a target to be net zero, you know, every company is going to need a team to work out how to get there. So firstly, you know, all existing companies are going to face that pressure. Uh, many have already expressed a goal uh, to get there. And in order to achieve it, they, they will have to create quite a number of green jobs uh, to, uh, to chart out the way forward. So you know, every, every organization is going to be looking at that. Uh, the, the, the Singapore government, the public service itself, you know, has already targeted uh, that we will max out. That means uh, we will not increase the carbon footprint uh, of public services uh, beyond 2025. Uh, so that's five years earlier than the rest of the country. So you know, being able to do that itself, again, puts a demand on uh, having persons and uh, expertise uh, to be green in, in how we do things. Um, in terms of um, you know, how, how are we progressing towards it, you know, I would say that um, uh, the first step is establishing the goals, and then I think having that focus uh, in being able to um, change our practices, uh, as well as to put in uh, the plans to, um, to get there. Um, so it's not a, I would say, a necessarily a straight line path, um, but uh, we have actually a good basis uh, to get started. And, and I would share from you know, the, the experience they had with the, uh, the green building journey, uh, and that's something I was more personally involved in. Uh, we started that journey in 2005. So that's about 17 years ago. And uh, today, you know, the best in class building, if you build a new super low energy building, you know, it would be 60% more energy efficient than the same building in 2005. Uh, but it comes about because we built up the expertise and the experience along the way. Uh, so if it took us you know, from uh, 2005 to um, say 2020 uh, to improve, uh, get up to 60%, you know, what's the next bound going to take? Uh, so you know, we, we, we have set uh, more stretch set of targets and that the best in class should be at least 80% more energy efficient uh, by 2030. So a lot of the low-hanging fruit has been, has been plucked and actually we, we have to push the next boundary uh, to get even more ambitious. And right now, I would say that a lot more of the professionals are more uh, custom how to achieve the, the, the easy part, you know, up to 60%. You know, but to squeeze another 20% uh, out, uh, that would take more, more effort. So if we don't stand still based on what we have achieved, uh, but we have to push the boundary to, to get to the next uh, uh, level of excellence. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Hugh, once again, for answering all our questions. And um, thank you also for your very interesting presentation. So can I call upon um, fellow Rotarians? Can, you un can we unmute our speaker and uh, give a big round of applause to you? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, yeah. Thank, Thank you. So, Thank you very um, much, Darren. On behalf of um, the Rotary Club of Singapore, you, uh, we'd like to wish you and your and the multi uh, task force, the multi ministry task force, you know, all the very best in this very uh, challenging task ahead um, to make Singapore a more livable city. 
and um, it's, it's definitely reassuring to hear what you've presented that uh, we are we are on track and uh, we'll make good progress towards that target. Thank, thank you, you once again. Much. Thank you, thank you, Hugh. It was a great pleasure to have you with us, and uh, we do hope you can join us uh, in future, especially when we have uh, projects that you know links up with what uh, CLC is doing. And perhaps if CLC has got a project that uh, you know the Rotary Club of Singapore can participate in, do let us know. Thank you so much. And uh, for next week, uh, we have Rotarian Hayden Hughes who will talk to us about classification. So um, for those who are non-Rotarians, you want to know what's classification, you join us next week and it will tell you. <laughs> okay. And then for... Uh, I think the director Subash, you have something they want to say for just one minute. Uh, well, uh, uh, thank you, President Lewis. I want to talk about this uh, RI President World Cup golf, you know, and this is uh, earlier was a window was from February 14 to February 20. Now, yesterday when we had a meeting, day before yesterday, we could shift the, uh, we could expand the date now we can play nine holes from January 15th to up to February 20th. So any period we can play the golf, register it, it'll be take, it'll be, you become a part, you will be participating in the complete World Cup. I'll send the little uh, flyer on this and request all of you who are the golfers or who have golfing friends to participate so that we can collect enough amount of money and polio project. Thank you very much. In, a, in the coming few days, you'll have a flyer from us so that I request all, even your club, other club members also can participate and probably we'll invite them as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I uh, look forward to seeing all of you again next week and especially 26th of uh, January, a physical meeting at Tangling Club, uh, Churchill Room. All right. So for now, stay back if you wish for a few minutes of fellowship. Otherwise, meeting is closed. <laughs>